welcome. Um, I want to, you know, this is, this is the best part of it. I mean, there were, um, I'd say 230 people in that module. So um, those of you who made it here, congratulations. You made it to the small breakout room, which I think is great. And it's your opportunity, if you have any specific questions for any of the panelists to, to ask them or panelists can ask other panelists. Um, so oh, can, can I just say something? Mm -hmm. Because Stephen is here. So Stephen Coles and his team from Fonts and Use, first of all, if you don't know that resource, it is an amazing resource. But um, Fonts and Use have just been such incredible help and support for the People's Graphic Design Archive, and they will be the developers on the archive. So I want to acknowledge and thank and bow down to Stephen and his team. Um, so it's nice to see him here, and I, I really want that shout out to him. That's nice. Thanks, Louise. It's all you. I'd like to know if those hands are going to really crush Stephen Cole's <laughs> I think Laurie would be happy about that. Oh, oh. Stephen, don't <laughs> say joking. that. I have a question for Saki, actually. Okay. I would. I'm so happy to to see your uh, talk a, a little bit more. Uh, you got to give a talk earlier for the archive, and it was nice to see more of it uh, today. I really am um, interested in how you think instructors can uh, incorporate more of uh, their students um, heritage in their teaching because I think that's such a powerful part of what you do is um, help them be more connected to the work by not trying to copy what maybe white European uh, designers were doing but really draw from their own experience and I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um... For me, it came. It, it, it wasn't any training that I had in it. It just came kind of naturally when I when I went to Yale for my MFA. Uh, I would say that um, the person who really sort of like uh, encouraged that was Alvin Eisenman, who was uh, the the chair, uh, head of department, and. Um, he, he, he's the one actually who <laughs> made me realize that there were writing systems from Africa. I didn't know about that. And when I knew that, my whole world view changed, you know, uh, how I understood design um, changed from that point onwards. Because I was like, well, wait a minute. So if we have our own writing systems, shouldn't our design be different? So that was the spark, really. And then when I, when I, when I got into uh, New York, because after grad school, especially if you go to New Haven, the natural place to end up is New York or Boston, but I think New York is cooler, so I went to New York. And, um, and I was always asked, uh, you know, when I sent out my, um, my, my portfolio, I would always get a call back. And I would think I always, initially I would think that I got the job, but they wanted to see me, to meet me. Because my name was, sound, my name sounds foreign. And they thought I was Japanese. So they were intrigued that a Japanese designer with a Swiss portfolio, this they wanted to see. And then I walk in and they're like, oh my God, this guy, you know, where are you from? <laughs> I'm like, I'm from Zimbabwe. They're like, that's Africa, right? I say, yeah. And they're like, but we don't see any, anything of Africa in your work. And initially I felt insulted, you know, because I was on that high horse of like, I went to Yale, I was taught by Paul Rand, I was taught by Bradbury Thompson, you know, I am, it so but after a while i got it what they were trying to say and i think that's when my whole approach to teaching changed that i felt that it was important like 
And I always ended up in, in, at schools where there was a large foreign student body. And so I'd ask them about their writing systems, you know, and discovered that, oh my God, there were like centuries traditions, especially in Asia, centuries of tradition of uh, design. But when they came to the West, it was almost like, okay, this is where you leave all that stuff here at the door. When you come in here, it's Western, you know? So through my work, I think I have been able to inspire other uh, design instructors around the world, really. And it's, my method is very simple. I just say, when I give a brief, I say to the students, you know, um, we go around the room and I say, where are you from? Tell me about where you're from, right? And then I ask them, what are the things that you, what are those things that are personal to you that you hold, you know, mm -hmm. dear about where you come from? And then they start telling me, some people say it's family. I say, who's in the family? Oh, my grandma, you know, I really love, I say, oh, okay, have you sat down with your grandma? Has grandma told, talk to you about your family history? And then they start to get it, you know? So it's really prodding. It's not like I tell them, this is what you do. I just kind of like get it out of them. Just like the Chinese, uh, the two Chinese students uh, at uh, Binghamton. So they were like, we, we know what we want to do, but we can't do it in English. <laughs> so in other words, we can't do it in a Western sense, you know? So I was like, do what comes naturally to you. And, and, and the design is there, like the, the, the color one, there was a bar with, with, a, with a, a, a character behind the bar. That's like somebody in prison. So human rights are, 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 not, are not recognized by the Chinese authorities, basically. That's what that, 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 that was saying, you know? And the family thing also was something that I, I didn't know about, that in China, your family is the people, your siblings, really. Not anyone else cannot be a family. So she was like saying, because here in America, family can be, whoever is in your circle. So that's kind of how it comes out. It, it really comes out by encouragement and by talking and making and then, the students feel comfortable mm -hmm. to talk about the, 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 themselves. I, do you find it, anyone here find it difficult to impart the importance of looking at histories to their students? All the time. You know, that how do you, how do you maintain, and Stephen, you and I had talked about this, how do you make them understand the importance of history? I think even Massimo Vignelli said that you can't, you can't be a good designer if you don't understand history. Well, he actually said you can't be a good designer without criticism. Well, he said a few things. Yeah. He said a <laughs> lot of things. But, a lot of things. you know, if anything good comes out of this pandemic, it's that groups like this get together. And there's going to be cross pollination. I mean, somebody today on the local radio station was saying after the Middle Ages uh, came the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very similar here. Mm -hmm. At the moment, uh, much schooling, particularly in New York, and I'm sure in California as well, is dominated by Asian cultures. And those cultures, for better or worse, have been kind of ignored in place of an American culture. They've come to Western schools to learn Western ideas. And I think certainly in the last few years, that's been the case at SVA, where uh, our Chinese and to some extent our Korean students 
have not really brought their culture into the classroom. And now that there is no classroom, there's the world as a classroom, more and more cultures, different cultures are coming together. And while I hate remote teaching and I'm not that fond of this pandemic, I do think that that's going to uh, change the way education will be practiced for years to come and perhaps forever. Yeah, because if you think about the fact that this, this uh, if there was no pandemic, we would be in LA at Art Center today. <laughs> How many, what would our audience be? How many people? So we, we, pandemic, we were saying that the pandemic allowed us yeah. to bring this to, to over, two, over 200 people, you know, yeah. without, you know, I, I thought that was amazing that we had I such a too. great, I mean, I see such great faces of people. Would Stephen had made the trip here? Alex, would you be able to? I don't know where other people are coming from. We've had, we had people from Brazil and people from Australia today mm -hmm. watching. And I think it's, it's true. We, we can't ignore the fact that this is not going to go away. You know, you, this hopefully you know, someone will say, gee, if I'm in Los Angeles, I'll, I'll go visit the HMCT. I think it's also, or we have everything online too. Our archive is accessible. So I don't have to go to Los Angeles, but I know it exists. And I think what we're doing here, what Louise is doing, people are now saying, oh, we're learning how to really use the resources of the internet. But yeah, Louise is a uh, pro program her her people's archive really does change the ground rules i mean there's been complaints about the canon for the last 25 years but before those 25 years there was nothing but the canon there was good graphic design and there was bad commercial art and now it's changed again this is a, a sea shift and and when louise says she's making history I, th I take that literally and figuratively. Um, it, it allows the doors and windows to be open a lot wider. And events like this will just help that air go more f flowing through uh, the various institutions and the like. But it'll be, you know, it's interesting. I, I see a, a number of different questions or kind of challenges. So what Saki was talking about and what I had, was talking about in my presentation, you know, this recognizing the individual lineage rather than the one that we have been told is our lineage as, as, as graphic designers. So when it starts with where somebody is from and what the personal is, and this is also what I was describing in Ramon Tejadas's and Silas, Silas Monroe's throwing the Bauhaus under the bus workshop where they do these kinds of diagrams. They actually map out what those lineages are. We're, we're talking about, well, two things come to mind. One is, um, then it suggests design and design education is local, you know, if it's because we're both talking like where somebody is from and from can mean a particular community, not just another country, but that the things are meaningful to that, that audience, to that group. And so if they're in a classroom outside their experience and you may not, because there's so much culture going on now. We're recognizing, we're talking about all these cultures in which things are meaningful. How, as, as you know, supposedly the teacher in the classroom, when you may be unfamiliar with that culture, with what things mean, with what the nuances are, how does that shift the conversation going on? 
it shifts the conversation. I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize, but it shifts the conversation where the student becomes the teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more of that, certainly in the graduate level. In undergraduate, it's going to be, it's not meant to be. Undergraduates are supposed to be getting basics and, and building upon those basics. But in graduate school, where you get so many people from different cultures, cultures that you don't know about, you have to, at first, for, force yourself to give them time. And then it will become natural where they'll take over some of the teaching. And it won't just be that teacher-centric, professor-centric. For me, the, the moment, the, the aha moment is when a student recognizes the importance of their own culture. And they, and especially also just like, I come from a very traditional kind of like uh, upbringing where I had both parents and I had uh, grandparents and I enjoyed the time I spent with my grandparents the most, especially my grandmother on my father's side. She told us a lot of stories that my parents never told me. And I can say some of my values I got from her and even the storytelling because I consider myself a good storyteller Stephen said so in his review of my book for I Magazine, he said, Mafunde is a good storyteller. Thank you, Steve. You recognized it in my writing. And um, I'm proud of that. So it's very easy for me to get children, uh, students to tell their stories because it's like within me, you know, I, it's, <laughs> You know, it's just part of me. I like stories. So when I hear them talking about their grandparents, their whatever, I, I show that I'm interested and they get confident. So that's how they, they produce the work that they produce. I, I think um, going back to Oh, we'll talk. Lorraine, you talk. I don't want to talk. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I, I was late to, to uh, take my, um, to unmute myself. I just wanted to say that um, one of the things I think is really interesting about this moment right now, especially with all the weird changes or, or the, um, fluidity of communication and all of these groups like our group today or the design history group on Fridays that's been meeting or the um, all the varieties of groups is that there's just been this kind of explosion of communication between people who are sharing interests and and so the moment seems incredibly incredibly rich but one of the things I still think that a lot of designers, even young design educators, don't really recognize is how, first of all, the vaunted canon, it's so thin. You know, it's like 25 names. You know, it's, it's nothing. And it's like that just simply because people have not been you know, doing the work. It, they've not been doing the work, the really hard work of digging out all the other stories that, you know, that need to be told. And so it's so interesting to me to hear uh, young, especially younger design educators going, I hate this canyon, where, canon, where is, you know, why do we have it? It's like, well, get yourself to an archive and start digging, you know, that it's, that the material is some, well, it's very hard to find. Things like Louise's project are kind of like a magnet pulling some of the material out. You know, there've been really good um, examples of, of local projects that have brought uh, lesser known figures to the fore. 
And it's the field is just getting richer as that happens, but it's a slow process. And, you know, I think that in one way, that's one of the exciting things about it. It's really exciting to see younger people getting interested in design history. Um, and I think that the, the simple way to do it is to sim always connect it to current practice, which is a very rather easy thing to do. But it's a really hopeful moment. And, um, uh, you know, I even think with uh, students from other co countries and cultures, um, for a few years now, at the beginning of the semester, when I start my design history sequence, I upfront say, hey, there's a lot of material, for instance, about China, graphic design in China, you know, that I actually don't have access to. If you have information, please get it. And of course, students go running back looking for a traditional design history of China, and then they can't find it. And then, the, you know, it st sort of starts the whole set of questions about, well, what, how, how would I start? Where would I, what would I look at? Anyway, it's a, it's a really interesting moment right now. And I think we just have to encourage everybody to dig in and, and find the stories. <laughs> as Saki is putting it. I think that's one of the issues is uh, engaging the student. And if it's relevant to the student, they'll be engaged, especially as it relates to current issues. Very important. Otherwise, I don't know how far back. I once had a discussion about whether or not there is an interest in history anymore. You know, does history matter when you say it's important to study history? A lot of my students will say, why? They're, you know, they're just, they, they're just not interested in something that didn't happen 20 days ago, let alone 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. And I think you're absolutely right, Lorraine, about my concern is how do they access this information? You know, you say, go look for the other, go look for something outside of the top 25, but where do they look? You know, where, wh who is keeping the repository of this? You know, they're very resourceful though. Yeah. I have had a class called no Google. <laughs> So they had to find their way around, which meant they had to talk to human beings. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten to the point where I don't want to talk to human beings anymore, but uh, these kids kind of get off on the fact that there are people, strangers, that they can call up on the telephone or go into a library and talk to a librarian. And somebody is telling them they can't do one thing, which is the easiest thing in the world to do. So they find ways of, of getting that information. Uh, or, you know, the wonderful thing about archives, I mean, I see Sasha's here, you know, when all of this stuff is on tables and you were talking earlier about the tactility, when you see it, something happens. There's a magic. If you're in this business, it's, you know, like being tickled. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain eroticism uh, about graphic design material. You're Paper. aroused by it. And I think that more and more uh, of the younger students and the younger students from other cultures get off on this material. And in part, it is because they can apply it to their own work in some way. I, I think uh, that's a great question. You know, being tactile is important. I mean, the minute, you know, students come into the, the letterpress room, for instance, and they're actually asked to touch type, um, someone has a question. Anna Sophia, she says there's a lot of noise in the background, so she put it in the chat room. And it's about teaching people to use digital archives. And this is where Jennifer Whitlock said, right? Jennifer says, how do you learn? ask the archivist. So Jennifer, if you can just say accessibility it is, is it's not difficult. 
but these archivists are here to assist, right, Jennifer? I mean. Absolutely. I mean, we'll never have everything digitized. I mean, I don't know anybody who will have everything digitized right. unless they make a magical fairy machine that can digitize things in 10 seconds or something. But because um, it's not just making a digital version of something, it's like you have to add metadata. You have to tag these things in some way that mm. anyone can find it. Otherwise, you just have a bunch of photos on a server. It doesn't right. help anyone. Um, you know, it's complex. And then I also think about how do you represent these things, right? I can unfold a brochure and scan it and show you a flat scan of it, but does that, it's not the same thing as interacting with something that unfolds or opens up or, you know, and seeing that up close, right? This sort of talking about that tactileness, right? There's a different quality to things when you see them in real life than when they're on the screen. So how do you project that, right? I mean, it's, more complicated than it sounds. It sounds like just digitize it. And it's like, oh. but how do we recreate closer to the real life experience? It's Has anybody here heard of the quarantine public library? <laughs> <laughs> oh, on the, on the internet archive? Is that what you're talking about? It's, it's, a, a, yeah. it's a site that's been set up by two printmaker bookmakers yeah. and it's called the quarantine public library so obviously they've done it since people have been quarantined and you can like blurb or like you know any of these on-demand publishers you can send your files in but you send them into their specifications which means it's a total pay you can get a 24 page book but you have to make the book mm. oh. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, <laughs> How does, I mean, it, so you have to make the book. Yeah, they'll print it for you, but then they'll send you back uh, a grid that you have to you follow a template, and you can make a book. So don't, don't we have that already? <laughs> <laughs> I never saw That's one. Familiar. <laughs> Sounds sounds somewhat familiar. Template, make a book. You know. um, well, there, but are, I, there are all sorts of books that show you how to make books. Right. But you know, this is something where you come, you bring a, a conventional form together with a digital form, mm -hmm. and the marriage may be successful. Not quite sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sure. stumped a little there. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I have issues with the yeah. online producing, you know, of, of books that aren't uh, well designed or, you know, or well, formatted. Well, I have problems with anything that's not Gutenberg, but uh, <laughs> that, that aside, you know, we're living in a culture now. I mean, for example, there's so much protest going on in the streets. Mm -hmm. Uh, it makes me remember, you know, Atelier Populaire in, in France in 68. And there are people that are trying to make protest images, mm -hmm. protest signs. They don't have backgrounds in graphic design. Right. Um, why not give them the opportunity to become graphic designers? Because right. It seems to me that that's what Louise is doing in a way in, in her archive. If people are putting things up that we wouldn't necessarily think of as graphic design. I, I know that from the Women's March in 2017, I think the City Museum of the, the Museum of the City of New York and some other museums <laughs> gathered up all of the all poster of the posters. House did that. And poster House did Well, Poster House has an exhibition about it, but they got the material from the city of New York. They really. got those from Boston, actually. And Boston, right. They got them from Boston, right. That's right. So, you know, people are now saying, saving things that would be considered ephemera, you know, had, had and thrown out, had we, and that's going to be part of, I think, what's valuable to Louise and her, and her site. Someone, it will be ephemera, but the fact that you can quickly archive it and tag it from where it's from, it'll have a, a history where normally something like that would be lost, you know? You, uh, you sorry, know. can I 
Hello, this is Behia. I'm here from Cairo. Um, Steve, we met, uh, and you, you actually were the last person I saw in New York before I headed back to Cairo. And I want to comment on the protest signs. Uh, so during the revolution in 2011, we also had mm. the same a collection of ephemeral signage that was mm. taking place on the street. And even, even though we archived and we had uh, those stored uh, online, um, unfortunately, they, there was an, um, a programmed system that took them down. Uh -huh. So you also have to keep in mind that there will be a counter mm -hmm. revolution to what's going on. And you have to always remember that with the digital sphere is creating a wonderful place for us to connect and share. And the fact that I'm with you now is, is actually amazing. Uh, but also we really need to keep in mind um, in 10 years down the road, who's going to be taking things down um, and how would you stop that? Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting dilemma. <laughs> yeah. We, we built the, the, the people's graphic design archive. I know I've, I've gotten associated with it and it's become Louise's design archive, but I really want to emphasize that it's the people's graphic design archive, but we did have to make this decision about as it's in this prototype and we really have to invite people or we have to add people who are able to contribute directly to the notion prototype. And we had to think, well, how far do we go with that access? Because if a bad actor goes in there and starts removing things and taking things down, um, you know, so it, it, that's a very interesting question that you're raising. Mm. Well, yeah, but that sure. kind of uh, counter agitation mm -hmm. has always been with us, whether it's digital or not. There's always yes. been a, a genre provocateurs and uh, disruptors. I guess my question was, uh, isn't it that like, say you have a, a, a site like yours, Louise, isn't it that you always keep a copy somewhere? Well, yeah, we do have to do that. And Stephen, <laughs> Stephen and his group have, have, have uh, cautioned us uh, about that. And I think, uh, Stephen, you have fonts and use site on uh, several locations, is that right? And I think the Letterform Archive is also in several locations. Well, that is one of the advantages of, of digital is that you right. can easily do backups. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you can make sure not only is it distributed more uh, quickly with CDNs and things like that, but you can also always have versions that are backed up. I think some people are concerned and one of the questions asked we didn't get to is concerned about plagiarism and rights of usage when you think about doing digital archives or, or such a wide, vast archive. I know that in the HMCT archive, we, we allow any educator or student to use it for student work, for educational purposes. But if it's used outside of that, it's, it's stated that you have to go back, if there's, a copy, if there's a copyright issue, you have to go back to the original source. And usually that has to do with, it came from a living, you know, a living person or a, an estate that's responsible. Sometimes we do own the copyrights mm -hmm. and the right to usage, but I know Louise in certain things, I, I'm sure you, I know you have a, a declaration too about this, but I think some mm -hmm. people are concerned about contributing to this about, you know, I, hey, if someone wants to use my work, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to sue you. I'd be really <laughs> pleased, but I think that's one of the main concerns is. Ha having been sued a few times, I can attest to the fact that there are people who do things for what seem like good causes, but they want to be paid for them when they're documented. And it's just one of those things, you know, I, I ended up having to settle two claims out of court, piss the hell out of me because mm -hmm. I was doing it not for profit, but for exposure of material. 
unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of the person who's done it because I've kept him in my mind for 25 years. <laughs> uh, but rights issues are always going to be problematic. And no court really has the c complete answer. And now that it's interna internationalized, uh, because of the internet, uh, doing projects, doing books, for example. It's one thing to have it in an archive, and it's another thing to use it. And even student use is questioned and questionable. At SVA, they took down the entire Vimeo account for SVA for two weeks because a student used something without permission. So... It's, it's one of the things, so much comes with a new age. You know, it's a wave that washes over you and sometimes you survive the wave and sometimes you get hit by the wave and knocked down. I have a Juan, question. did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking a lot about what Jennifer mentioned that um, then only everything can be digitized. That's a very, uh, very difficult challenge. And I guess, you know, being from a background that's been excluded from the history of design, uh, not everything will be digitized, right? But we can prioritize what gets acquired, what gets digitized, what gets printed, what gets discussed, what makes it into a program, and ultimately what makes it into a canon, right? And so to borrow like Ramon Tejada's words, like how do we think, reframe, and recontextualize how we approaching the work of archives and in turn, the relationship between archives and teachers within our own curriculum, uh, both for instructors and archives that are doing this work. Uh, what are you uh, thinking about doing that could extend beyond this post-pandemic world, beyond the fact that we're all on Zoom, right? Because we, these conversations are really important, but how do we keep this going at the same time when things actually open up a little bit more? If I can answer, I, I, I just try to make people aware that there are archives of various sorts and that you don't go to the same reference points all the time. Uh, those are always the things in the bibliographies and, um, you know, years ago I was doing work on ethnic and racial stereotypes and I found a, a Chinese American uh, archive that I didn't know about and the kind of material they had was incredible in terms of what it said about American culture and how the Chinese were depicted. Uh, I wouldn't have known that had I not stumbled upon it and I think the job now is for people who know these things to put them into a database and maybe it's at the people's uh, archive or maybe it's something else uh, because of the digital world, we can expand everything to, you know, all hundreds and thousands of people. I, I think we have an opportunity now to really, like, kind of reconvene um, around the thought of a people's archive. But, and maybe to answer Juan, I know there are so many archives. I mean, we were looking, we were looking all over, like, what archives are there? You know, we can only have four panels, but I'm sure there are archives in, in Egypt is, well, the greatest library in the world started in Egypt. Um, there are wonderful archives in South America, in Central America. And it's a question of, if, because we're digital like this, I think maybe it might be an interesting forum, the next one, see, I'm already thinking, to look at something very specific to deal with you know, the democratization and what exists, because unless you look for it, you won't see it, you won't find it. Um, and I think, I know the HMCT, we're always interested in what, you know, we had a show on multi-script, you know, language. I think that's another area of interest. There's so much out there already that people don't know that's undiscovered because number one, not being digitized. I think digit digitizing is very expensive. But if people can be made aware that they do exist, I think. I think would... I'm sorry. I think we should have a Comic Con for archives. I mean, people just come and share their archives. Right. 
their right. personal archives, their institutional archives, their museum archives, their organizational archives, business archives. You know, if, so if somebody would support that, which would require a consortium of schools or other scholarly mm -hmm. organizations, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Gloria but, mentioned that yesterday about the uh, a conference for design archive archivists. Yeah, specifically, That's my I mean, dream. Stephen, yours is wide. Yours is wide, you know, business and stuff like that. Mine is a little narrower. Mine deals with either something about the book or, you know, it has to deal with the book language type you know, writing systems. I'm, I'm, that's, you know, that's my wheelhouse, not, and design, of course, the business people, I'm sorry, go ahead, you know, <laughs> but, um, but well, I, when I talk about business, I mean, you know, you walk like this ProQuest thing was a revelation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just find all the ads that you never knew about that uh, designers whose names you do know about did. Right. Uh, so, so it's, it's business in that, Graphic design is a service of business. Right. right. No, I, I agree. I mean, I wanted to say two things. One is about um, the vitality of tagging and how tagging is important in, in, in finding things. Um, but going to this idea of other kinds of archives where things may have hidden, like one time I was at the LA County Museum of Art and uh, they don't, they only have their own archives. They're not a, they don't have archives of others of say designers or artists um, and discovered in their archives in the museum's archives all this material we might call graphic design they had these incredible designed resumes for one we found april griman's resume that she had submitted i think to lou danziger and it was the most incredible piece of graphic design. And we never would have found it. We like stumbled on it, but here it was in an archive of the museum itself. What's great is when you're looking through somebody's files, which you could call an archive, a personal yeah. archive, yeah. is to find something that you've sent to them. Yeah. And that I was doing uh, an essay <laughs> or an exhibition on E. McKnight Cowfer. And I went to the poet Grace Shulman, and she had a whole stack of papers because she was friendly with them. And at some point, I must have learned that she had those papers because there was a letter from me in her files asking for material. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if you have enough time and you go to enough places and see enough people, you'll find great stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a big world. Yeah, I want to mention something else that I think is really important, which is uh, kind of tangential to these archives, which is another avenue of the preservation of the history and getting, you know, the facts or at least the perception around them. You know, a lot of there's a lot of older people who have a lot of knowledge who may not be around <laughs> and unless oral histories are done with them. Um, that that, not, that experience, that knowledge, all of that is going to go away. And so filling in the factual record becomes that much more difficult. So, you know, I think about design emergencies and I think um, documenting these stories um, with people who were part of the design world, who were designers, who did something they called design. Um, uh, recently, um, a, a, a scholar reached out because they were, they were an art historian and they wanted to know what um, uh, people who had designed um, the, the um, book covers for black authors, what were they told about the kind of representation to make? So that's that's not that's probably going to come from stories that have been documented and again this importance of tagging things um so that things can be found for all kinds of reasons well you've got a course there that you can start at a at a school any school teaching kids how to do oral histories mm -hmm. And that becomes as important as uh, learning how to use type and kerning and mm -hmm. uh, 
I actually can contribute a little bit to that uh, personal experience. When I was working at uh, Random House as an art director, um, I just by chance, somebody gave me a title that uh, had been given to some of the top designers who, who worked for Knopf. Knopf is the cream de la creme of designers at Random House uh, as an imprint. So it wasn't working and the author wasn't happy. So somebody said, hey, this, this guy Saki, try him. And I did it and the author was ecstatic, you know? And so from that point onwards, every, a lot of the books I got were by black authors. And I realized why, because when I got the, the title, I would read the book first. I just wouldn't design it because it was by a black author, like there was a, a, a cover by, for an African author. And they were putting masks there on the cover because it's by an African author. And she's not from a, a region where there's a tradition of mm. masks. So I was able to give that book the sort of like uh, um, sensitivity that it needed. So yeah, it's, those are some of the stories that should be uh, collected as well. Uh, Louise, I agree with you mm -hmm. on that point. I also think students have to learn research again. I mean, you know, and I'm talking about archival research. Um, we started a, an instructor at Art Center, uh, started something called Design Atlas, where she's having the students research what they feel is important visual information that describes our graphic terms our graphic narratives. So it's the students who are going out to decide and look for, and this is, you know, students from all over the world. It's so I think empowering the students to bring to the classroom what they consider reference work that refers to, you know, what does, you know, uh, a, a grid mean? What does black and white mean? What does, you know, negative space mean? And it's interesting when you see what they bring in versus what you might show them as an example. Um, so I thought it was a very good exercise and I don't think it's, she was gonna make it sort of like what Louise was doing, making it accessible to everyone, starting with you know, your typical terminology of design and typography and then applying the student's research to what they feel represents it and not just going outside of your typical you know, top 25. So it's, it's another way, I think, to expand what we consider archival, and we said it earlier, is have your students do it for you or let them bring it into the classroom. The other thing that's terribly underused or underrepresented are the thousands of thesis projects that are out in the world yeah. and they're in school yeah. libraries and there needs to be a, a central clearinghouse for uh, some way of registering all that's been done just I think as one the of the databases of is, is, yeah. is there a database that does that? I think that? one of the you know LexisNexis or one of those you know has yeah because I tried pieces. I tried looking but, on LexisNexis once and couldn't find well, like I tried to find one that came out of Yale and you had to get permission from Yale and that. Yeah, there's all sorts of rights issues. Yeah. But, you know, there is, like, is been numbers for books. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be uh, thesis numbers for thesis. It doesn't mean you're giving away the story. It's not like going to JSTOR or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just you're giving away a title and a synopsis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, before we end, because I know we're tired. <laughs> This has been great. I do have one more giveaway. Aha. And um, I'm going to share my screen. If you've gotten something already, you cannot get this. Okay, I'm sorry. 
So what I'm, the first thing you're playing, you're, you're going to guess for, everything has information, okay? Everything has information. The answer to this question will get you a limited edition pressing issues done by the students at Archetype Press. But you have to, you've been looking at my screen now for three hours. I want you to tell me who designed that poster. And Gloria, do you want Armin this in the chat or you want Armin No, Hoffman. no, you're not supposed to answer, Stephen. You can't. You can't. Uh, I can't help myself. It's like a sickness. Oh, I was, I was just trying to get people to see if they actually paid attention. Did anyone answer? Oh. I take it back. It wasn't Armin Hoffman. Oh, it was. It was Hoffman Armin. <laughs> Hoffman Armin. Oh, you blow it. You blow it. Okay, so I'm, you know, can someone tell me? Not you, Stephen. The school in Switzerland that he taught at. The Kunstgewerbe Schule. Oh, Lorraine, you got it. <laughs> 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 Lorraine gets it just because she can pronounce it too. <laughs> yeah, I've worked on that for years. I know. I have been practicing because I've been practicing for years and years and years because every time I talk about Leah Hoffmitz, I have to mention that she studied with Armin Hoffman and Wolfgang Weingart. And I just keep, one day I'll get the name of the school right. Is that poster from Leah's collection? Yes, it is. Yeah. We have about mm, 16 would you yeah. say, Armin Hoffman posters? And he was 100 years old last week. Yes, he ah. was. We, and, and we'll end on this. So we, we realized he turned 100. So we were going to post something, one of his pieces saying, remembering, you know, Armin Hoffman. And thank God we checked because he's still alive. <laughs> so we almost posted like in remembrance. Yeah, of, he sure is still alive. He sure. sure is still alive. No. So I want to thank everyone for, again, my panelists, they're just terrific. I know you have to, um, I know you must be exhausted. And Steven, I know you have to run. Louise, Jennifer, Saki, thank you all. And thank you all. I'm so happy we had this chance to have this. Yeah. I see Alex has, and, I, and I, mo I know mostly everyone here, and I'm glad you're able to come to this more intimate environment where it's a little more relaxed. Um, but keep looking where uh, it's very important that we understand. I know at least it is the HNCT that we look at the wider audience, you know, that we don't address what we normally address, that we just keep, you know, this I think has been a stake in the ground year, as Stephen Heller says, you know, the pandemic is changing everything. So with that said, um, we're gonna relax. We have yet another module at two o'clock on uh, teaching essential typography, which is going to be interesting. I think it's going to be wild. If you don't know, it's going to be Ty Drake and Simon Johnston together. So, <laughs> and if you don't know who they are, get ready for a wild ride, both of them. Um, so thank you all. And um, thank you for coming And Lorraine, Clifford will get your address. Oh, sure. <laughs> and, and, we'll, and we'll send it off to you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.